Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the At Monty Hart CAF Conference. Today we have Dr. Marcella Calfon Press, who is an Associate Clinical Professor of Cardiology at the David Geffen School of Medicine in UCLA. She is a co-director of the uh, UCLA Women's Cardiovascular Health Center and an interventional cardiologist who has deep expertise in mitral clip. Today, she's going to speak to us about uh, mitral valve disease management, mitral clip, and show us some challenging cases. Just so you know a little bit about her background, she received her medical degree from New York University and did her internship at Brigham Women's Hospital, as well as her residency, and then her fellowship in cardiology, interventional cardiology, with some uh, additional training in endovascular interventions. She is uh, very gracious to get up so early in the morning from the West Coast to speak to us today about mitral regurgitation and the role of transcatheter mitral valve repair in the current era. Welcome, Dr. Press. Thank you so much, Dr. Bornick. I'm so excited to be here um, despite the hour. Uh, if I am a little slow in some of my words here, just give me a break because it's 4.30 in the morning here in California, but so excited to welcome my East Coast colleagues and talk about my favorite topic, which is mitral regurgitation. Um, so uh, let me just move my screen here. Um, my disclosure is that I am a procedural proctor for the Abbott mitral clip device, and I will be talking about that device. I'll be starting with uh, a very basic background of the anatomy of the mitral valve, because I believe that in order to understand management, the key is in anatomy and understanding the function and how these devices apply to each valve. Uh, we're gonna talk specifically about regurgitation and we'll talk about severity and etiology. We'll also talk about transcatheter edge to edge repair. And I'm focusing on mitral clip really because it's the only FDA approved device. Uh, and we'll discuss procedural considerations uh, of the device. And we'll talk about some of its evidence in both degenerative and functional MR. And we'll summarize the updated guidelines uh, in, in management of patients that have uh, mitral regurgitation. I will end with some case examples as we uh, lead into discussions in the future of the, in this field. Uh, and uh, I hope that um, you guys can uh, you know, ask questions. And I know that Dr. Bornick will be able to sort of relay those questions uh, throughout the um, chat. So the mitral valve is uh, really amazing if you think about what its function is. It's really uh, works as a, as a unit. I think of the valve, this mitral valve as a joint, as if it's like a knee joint. It's really complicated. It's really very different from the aortic valve where, um, you know, it's the aortic valve having, you know, two or three leaflets uh, in working, you know, without a sub aortic apparatus. The mitral valve has so many different parts and each part really needs to work um, in concert in order to function. Um, you really, uh, the, the coordinating opening closing of these valves uh, occurs so many times in a lifespan and it's really required to, to um, function for, to allow unidire unidirectional flow in the heart. What's amazing is how much pressure it's forced. Not only does it have to beat millions and billions of times, but it has to actually face the highest closing pressure of any uh, valve in the heart. So it's really the powerhouse uh, in, in the heart. Way that it forms, you know, it starts forming at week five uh, in, in utero and it forms through these um, mesenchymal cells that actually grow from the lateral and dorsal cushions uh, that, that basically fuse uh, with, the, um, with the septum. And the neat thing about it is that it's the valve is actually hollowed out uh, from this ingrowth of tissue. And you get these sort of remnant tissues which become the cords. Uh, you have primary cords which attach to the tip of the valve and you have secondary cords that attach to the base of the valve. And then you even have tertiary cords that are within the, the sort of the annulus that attach to the annulus. Um, what's really important to understand is that at the commissures, you have a very, very, very dense uh, network of, uh, of um, cords, uh, and you have a, a cord-free zone in the middle of the valve, uh, which is really important to understand when, you talk, when we discuss sort of techniques and, and challenges of, of the valve. Um, if you look at the anatomy specifically, you'll see that the cords are attached to the papillary muscles and to the ventricle, and that the um, valve itself 
uh, it has uh, two main leaflets, an anterior and a posterior leaflet, and that the anterior leaflet is almost continuous with the aortic, uh, with the aorta. So it forms this atrial mitral curtain, uh, and these structures are all continuous with each, with each other. You see that the anterior leaflet's almost more anteroseptal in position, and the posterior leaflet is more posterior lateral in position. And you see uh, the tricuspid valve here, and you can see that the septal leaflet, the three leaflets of the tricuspid valve, the septal leaflet being sort of anchored to the skeleton of the heart and the aorta obviously being the more anterior structure. And really need to understand, especially because of the um, importance of imaging and understanding the anatomy of its surrounding structures is also important uh, in, in this process. If you look here on the right, like I mentioned, this uh, aorta mitral curtain, and you can see how continuous the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is with the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. When you look at the uh, composition of the valve, you know it's three-layered. It has a layer of elastin, proteoglycan in the middle, and then fibrosa at the bottom ventricular surface. The shape of the mitral valve is really important. As you notice, uh, when you look at it on FOSS, it's not circular, it's elliptical. And not only is it elliptical, but it, it exists in three dimensions. It's the anterior and posterior surface are actually not in the same dimension, and it almost looks like a rocking chair. Uh, the trigones, which are the um, sections that are uh, um, uh, attached to the uh, medial and lateral commissure, uh, sort of are in one plane and the anterior posterior uh, um, uh, uh, sides are in another plane and these are not in the same plane. Uh, so any uh, changes to the shape annulus of the mitral valve can occur. It can be uh, become circular or it can be pulled down in one direction or in the other. And this can significantly affect um, function of the valve. Also, you'll notice that um, even though on the left, the schematic looks like a simple uh, you know, valve where it's uh, three scallops on the anterior and three scallops in the posterior, the reality is that most valves are not that simple and that each valve is different. I think of these valves as fingerprints and no two valves are the same. So it's really important to understand that uh, even though you may have an A3, A2 and A1 scallop from medial to lateral, each of those scallops can have clefts and de de be divided into even smaller scallops. Um, the A3 is always the most medial uh, scallop. So I like to think of the septum being on the right and just marching down three, two, one from septum to lateral uh, atria. Um, what's amazing is that the morphology and anatomy of the mitral valve has been described since da Vinci in 1400s. And if you look at these amazing drawings from him, uh, it's amazing how incredibly accurate they were and how precise they were in, in terms of describing the anatomy. So much so that I would argue that our current schematics no, don't compare at all in terms of the detail that he, he gave us. But for these schematics, again, this is a very simple schematic and I'll go into more detail and let you know that this is, this is just one basic way of understanding regurgitation and dividing it into two different um, etiologies, one being a degenerative etiology or primary etiology where there's either a prolapse or a flail, and the second being a functional etiology where the leaflets are completely normal, but like I mentioned earlier, the annulus is somehow uh, disrupted either by uh, circular dilatation uh, from either an atrial or ventricular problem resulting in a central uh, jet that um, causes regurgitation. So, um, if only things were that easy, right? Most valves are not just one or the other, and there can be definite variations or combinations of the above. And if you really wanna understand the etiology, you need to understand TEE and, and the imaging and success of fixing or repairing uh, these device, these valves is, is all in imaging. And so understanding the T, that TEE will show you etiology uh, and, um, and also pretty much guide your management. You can get a lot out of the transthoracic, obviously, and, and more, most importantly, when I look at a transthoracic echo, I'll look at obvious uh, you know, flail or prolapse, or I'll look for calcium, and I'll look at the, uh, the um, direction of the jet. You know, In general, when the jet's central, we know that it's likely to be a functional, and if you have an eccentric jet, it's more suggestive of a prolapse, although uh, posterior tethering is a form of functional uh, MR and can give you uh, as well anterior directed jets. Uh, 
So the TEE will, will really answer that question definitively. So once we look at these two types of, of diseases, the primary degenerative versus the functional, uh, you can see that the functionals are even divided into atrial functional or ventricular functional. Atrial functional occurs more often in people that have AFib, they have dilated atria, uh, which lead to, again, uh, changes in the annular uh, dimensions resulting in malcoaptation, uh, often seen in patients that have diastolic heart failure, uh, and they often have more than, more than mitral, it's often mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. Ventricular functional is the more, more sort of, had been the more classically defined. Uh, I think we're starting to appreciate atrial functional more now that we have, uh, that we have these devices, but ventricular functional meaning patients that have systolic heart failure, usually ischemic or non-ischemic, that result in either central coaptation or like I said earlier, posterior tethering of the leaflet from ischemia. Mixed regurgitation would be those patients that have sort of a combination of the above, um, where you may have some calcification restriction, some uh, malcoaptation resulting in relative prolapse. You might even have some mitral stenosis in there where you know the valve is just abnormal, but there are components of malcoaptation and um, primary pathology. Then you have all your different variations of prolapse, either prolapse of either scallop in the anterior posterior, you may or may not have a flail, which is defined as a ruptured cord. And then finally, the more aggressive kind of early onset disease of Barlow's where, you know, all the leaflets are uh, um, redundant and you have cordal lengthening and prolapse of every scallop um, becoming uh, challenging both uh, for percutaneous approaches and surgical approaches in terms of um, repairing these valves. So etiologies of these valves and Barlow's, like I said, is a very aggressive, it has a bimodal distribution often in younger patients. Uh, and then the more common prolapse has been thought to be some type of fibroelastic deficiency occurring in older patients where patients can live with uh, prolapse for years, uh, maybe discovered for a murmur in their young, when they're in their 20s or 30s, or they're told they had a prolapse. And then when they reach 50 or 60, they get more uh, prolapse and then they start to get regurgitation. And then when they're 80 or 90, that um, uh, prolapse and regurgitation results in a flail where they can come in uh, quite, quite sick. So these are important um, diseases to identify early in life and to follow carefully. The thought is that it occurs from some connective tissue problem, although I have to say one of the mo most fascinating questions in the future would be, what are the sort of genetic predispositions for people that have prolapse and you know, they're, they, are they familial or what really causes prolapse? Because I don't think we entirely understand the pathology of that. Um, in terms of secondary MR, um, I, we already talked about um, many of the different causes, usually an atrial or ventricular problem. The treatment of degenerative or primary MR is to treat the valve because the problem is the valve, not the atria or the ventricle. And the treatment of secondary MR is to treat the atria or the ventricle first, meaning treat the AFib, unload the LV, bring down the pressures, diurese the patient, uh, and then, uh, or potentially revascularize if indicated and uh, you know, give, um, uh, give them CRT or BIV and then pursue uh, um, either surgery or uh, mitral club. So it's a second line uh, for secondary MR. Here's a picture of prolapse in the OR. You can see how thick and abnormal that P2 segment is. So it's really, a, like I mentioned, it's not just lengthening of the cord, the, the whole leaflet and the, the valve is very, very abnormal. And um, there's probably more going on than just a deficiency of uh, fibroblastin. There's just a very abnormal thickened uh, valve and, and cords. Here is the um, flail segment that you can see when the cord ruptures underneath. Uh, you see a small flail, a primary cord here at the tip of the leaflet being torn. This is a Barlow, as I mentioned earlier, really the entire valve is redundant and thick uh, and all leaflets and scallops are involved. So very difficult to treat. So how big is MR of a problem? So MR is a very big problem. It, it, it's actually more common than aortic stenosis. And I kind of, um, I don't myself do TAVR, so I can knock on TAVR and say that TAVRs are really wonderful and amazing and amazing, but mitral regurgitation is like even more of a problem. And I think uh, 
less appreciated, less understood, and less often diagnosed than AS. And I think when we talk to our patients about AS, we're very clear about the prognosis uh, being poor once you become symptomatic without treatment. But when we talk about MR, I think those discussions um, really need to, uh, we really need to understand that when a patient comes in with mitral regurgitation and symptomatic, that their prognosis is nearly as bad as if they had AS. And so it is really important to understand that the natural history of symptomatic MR uh, is, is, uh, is, can be um, associated with increase in mortality and morbidity. And this occurs over time. And so the older you are, um, you know, the more common valve disease will be. Um, one of the reasons that I think it's been hard to sort of nail, nail MR as we've sort of nailed AS is because because of the fact that MR's etiology is just so, uh, you know, we have so many different types of MR and the, certainly the different type of MR you have is gonna dictate your, um, your uh, morbidity or mortality. So you can't group MR altogether and say, okay, all MR has this uh, prognosis. Um, although people have tried, so this study, which is very, very dated in 96, looked at all comers with MR uh, and over time by echo criteria, what happened to them at 10 years. And so you'll see that there was a high incidence of, a, of AFib, heart failure, and about um, uh, you know, a uh, incidence of death uh, in surgery or death at 10 years of up to very, very high. So um, again, this is a very old study. So I only show you that to, so you understand that um, natural history over, over 10 years uh, is, is um, is, is significant. When we look at trying to break down the etiology, and let's say you want to, you have a patient with functional MR, and you say, okay, what's your prognosis if left alone, versus a patient with degenerative MR, what's your prognosis if left alone? Um, for degenerative MR, you know, this is not, this was not a randomized control study. This is just looking at the um, history of prognosis of patients who either went surgical or conservative treatment in high risk patients. And if you look at the degenerative MR group treated medically who did not go undergo surgery, they had about a 30% uh, 12 month mortality. And if you look at patients in the COAPT arm, which I will talk about COAPT um, more formally in, in a few slides, but if you just looked at the medical RX arm in COAPT, which was a study of functional regurgitation, their uh, you know, untreated arm had up to 76% death or hospitalization at two years. So we know that if you had a patient say you didn't know what type of MR they had, you're probably looking at somewhere around a 50% uh, two year, uh, either death or heart failure um, or hospitalization. So significant. Why it does MR, is it so important to treat MR and why does it, can it affect your prognosis? And so the reason is that um, patients who have uh, longstanding untreated MR uh, can really um, impact, uh, you know, the, the hemodynamics significantly of the heart. So what are the hemodynamics? So the mitral valve in regurgitation obviously fails to close. It results in blood flowing back into the left atrium during systole, and that causes increasing in LA pressures and wedge. And it's that increase in pulmonary venous pressure that gives patients that sensation of dyspnea. Um, it causes uh, basically that constant backflow results in no true iso isovolemic volume contraction. And so and eventually what that does is basically decrease your afterload naturally. So you have no uh, resistance and blood is going backwards instead of forwards. Uh, eventually that causes LV volume uh, load causing dilation and then resulting in LV pressure load over time. And then uh, that can cause a reduction in stroke volume uh, and, um, sorry, reduction in cardiac output. So, um, but if you do look at, uh, you know, the, for example, ejection fraction in these patients, it's not a fair assessment. So if somebody's EF is normal, um, their cardiac output may still be low because their, um, uh, because their effective uh, forward flow is reduced. So I don't use ejection fraction and we shouldn't be using ejection fraction to uh, really determine severity. Um, the right heart cath and pressures and output are much more useful than EF. So a patient with an EF of 75%, it may have, a, it may be, um, you know, uh, is actually an abnormal EF in somebody with MR because that EF is that heart's trying to go extra hard to try to uh, compensate for the regurgitation. So you'll often see a very hyper contractile EF uh, before the EF starts to fail. And that's again, because 
the, um, the heart is trying to increase its stroke volume to maintain cardiac output. So um, as I sort of mentioned and summarized, untreated MR carries a very poor prognosis and can lead to heart failure and death. The prevalence, uh, prevalence and severity increases with age and um, about nearly 50% of patients that have mitral valve um, symptoms uh, that are referred to surgery are often turned down due to age and comorbidities. And so this is really where the um, percutaneous therapies come into play. It's these patients that are not surgical candidates um, who have significant morbidity and mortality if left untreated. And the goal of our percutaneous therapies as in any disease are to one, reduce symptoms and two, impact mortality if we can. So as most of uh, intervention, you know, the, even with stents and, and, and TAVRs, you know, the, w w these discoveries always started as an alternative to surgery and they always start in high risk patients, right? Those that are elderly, flail, uh, comorbid conditions, high surgical uh, thoracic surgery scores, whether they have cirrhosis or hostile chest, these are some of the reasons why patients are turned down for surgery. Um, but over time, we start to see clinical equipoise where we see that this technology can emerge and the experience uh, and um, devices change over time. And so we start to understand um, what the definition of success means. And so, uh, you know, patients who undergo uh, percutaneous repair, procedural success is very different than those who undergo surgical repair. And we start to understand that um, these percutaneous devices over time have emerged and they actually have clinical equipoise uh, to our surgical, um, surgical uh, alternatives. So I don't consider them alternative anymore, although that's uh, you know, how these uh, devices uh, sort of started. They um, also, these devices and, and really help us to understand the complexity of disease. And so I think that with these, uh, this field, of percutaneous intervention, it actually behooves us and forces us to understand the valve in more detail than we ever did. And so as we develop these technologies, we also learn so much more about the disease process and they sort of go hand in hand. But what we understand is as we have more tools and as we understand the disease more, the decision-making becomes even more complex. And so these uh, procedures and patients really require a heart team approach to understand all the options that they have to understand the anatomy, the physiology and treatment, whether it's medical, surgery or percutaneous. So what are the other treatments um, existing in future? So there are many different annuloplasty devices, uh, Carillon uh, mitral system here, that's kind of a, goes through the coronary sinus and cinches. There are other types of cinching devices uh, that sort of try to do annuloplasty. None of these are FDA approved. Um, Mitroclip is the only edge to edge FDA approved device uh, on the market. Um, Pascal is, is also on the market, currently being studied in various trials, but a very similar approach to edge-to-edge -edge repair uh, by Edwards. And then you have various uh, multiple companies who are out there trying to find the first, discover the first and best uh, mitral valve replacement options. You have Tendine, Intrepid, and M3 that are uh, close to um, probably the closest. Uh, but what's, like I mentioned earlier, these um, valve, you know, these technologies are so exciting, but I think what they also do is uh, provide a challenge for management to understand how do they all work together uh, in terms of treating patients. So um, I'm going to focus on MitraClip because, like I said, it's, it's the FDA approved, uh, the one that I have the most experience uh, working with, and so I will focus on that. So MitraClip, which is a device that uh, is percutaneous, is uh, a um, 24 French device that's inserted through the right common femoral vein or left common femoral vein. And it's uh, advanced into the left atrium through a transeptal, usually about eight millimeters in size, and then advanced into the left ventricle uh, below the leaflets uh, of the mitral valve. The clip is opened and pulled back such that the leaflets then uh, sort of uh, um, lie within the arms uh, of the device. And as the uh, device is pulled back, uh, the leaflets sit nicely into the device. And then the device has these grippers that you see on the upper right, which are teeth that get dropped to secure and anchor the, the leaflets. And then the device is closed 
as the device is closed, the leaflets are pulled together towards each other. Uh, and once you have a good um, grasp and you feel that you were able to reduce your regurgitation significantly, you, um, you uh, can release the device. Uh, this is a very slow and methodical and uh, you know, uh, unlike TAVR, there's no rapid pacing. It's very, you know, these are these cases. Um, there's no rush to deploy these these um, clips. You can invert them. You can readjust them multiple times until you release. So it's based on the Alfiori technique. Alfiori was a, um, a surgeon uh, a couple uh, decades ago who uh, based his repair on noticing that. Um, the congenital patients with double orifice mitral valves never really had regurgitation. And he noticed that as an observation and decided to adapt his surgical technique based on his observation where he would uh, basically suture together the diseased valve to the um, uh, contralateral leaflet and uh, again, create this double orifice uh, technique. If you look at the sort of anatomical uh, sort of considerations. If you have a patient that you're considering using an edge to edge repair, there are a couple of things that you wanna consider. For example, where the prolapse is, if it's degenerative, uh, whether you have multiple leaflets involved, if there's a commissural involvement, um, whether you have Barlow, uh, where again, the entire valve is, is abnormal. Um, if you have calcification, you know, the more calcium you have, maybe the more challenging the procedure may be, it may affect its, it may affect your mitral valve area or your initial gradient. In general, we don't um, like to clip things that have in mitral valve area less than three and a half, four being the formal cutoff for many of the trials, but three and a half being more of a practical cutoff. Um, gradient is a little bit less reliable because as we know, patients who have a lot of MR can have higher gradients um, due to the flow uh, across the valve. And so a gradient of five is, is, is often our, our cutoff. But again, I, I take valvaria a little bit more. Um, I, I, I look at the valvaria a little bit more than the gradient in these cases. Um, and then obviously patients who have big flail widths or flail gaps can be more challenging. Um, how, where did the evidence come from for mitroclips? So the device was first implanted back in 2003. Uh, in uh, Venezuela, it was the first in human uh, um, uh, implantation. Uh, it was then, um, you know, FDA approved in 2013. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we've had experience uh, with um, this device uh, since FDA approval, of almost 10 years, about nine years, uh, or eight years. Um, so uh, there's been various trials along the way. And the two big landmark studies are Everest which was in 2005, about a three-year study, and then obviously co opt in 2013 when it started en enrolling. So those are the trials that I'm gonna really briefly mention because I think if you, if you need to know anything about MitraClip or any of the data, those are the main two trials that you obviously don't wanna miss. Um, Everest two, which was a randomized clinical trial, was a very small trial. If you think about what led to the FDA uh, approval, it was based on a trial of only 280 patients. And in cardiology, that's actually a relatively small number of patients. Uh, but it was a very important trial. It looked at patients that had either three or four plus um, regurgitation, randomized them two to one to either um, device or control, and looked at echocardiographic criteria at um, uh, 30 days, six months, uh, one year, 18 months, and two years. What uh, It was a safety and efficacy study uh, predominantly, and what one of the most um, important findings are that uh, the um, procedural success, again, this was first gen, uh, you know, initial uh, sort of low volume, uh, you know, um, uh, operators in the beginning of the trial, uh, their success rate was about 80% and success was defined as a greater than two plus reduction in regurgitation. And that's obviously going to be much, much lower than a surgeon. You know, if a surgeon operates on a patient and they had an 80% success rate, that surgeon would never be operating. A, a surgeon goes in and they have almost a hundred percent success rate because they can see what they're doing in the OR. And when they come off pump, they know the, you know, their regurgitation, what's left, they can go back in, they can um, tweak things and it's an open sternotomy. So off, off, obviously they have the, they can fix the valve nearly, nearly to perfection surgically. So we don't really compare procedural success. I think if you look to procedural success, surgery would nearly always win uh, versus uh, mitroclip. But what's really important to understand is that 
despite their procedural success, um, if you were able to achieve more than two grade reduction, the, the clinical response for these patients was, was better than the control group, meaning that even though these patients didn't achieve 97% of procedural success, they still achieved um, 97% reduction to, of NYHA class. And so what it, what it says is you do not need to achieve mild MR to have a successful procedure. And that's why I meant earlier when I said our definitions of success and percutaneous approaches are different than our surgeons. And our success is not achieving a tr trivial or mild MR and having a surgical result. Our success is what is our, our um, are the clinical uh, sort of um, effects on the patient? Do they feel better uh, from the intervention? And that might be only a one or two grade reduction that all that's all you can get, but those patients generally will feel better. Um, so the 2013 sort of uh, news break was that, um, you know, that the FDA cleared MitroClip, uh, and it initially, uh, it's really only a, approved um, for patients who are prohibitive risk. And this hasn't changed uh, in these eight years. It, it still is only approved for patients that are prohibitive surgical risk. And, and again, that seems um, obvious, right? If you have a young patient who's a good surgical candidate, you wouldn't really want to do a procedure that is may not have the same procedural success as some as surgery, uh, because their surgical risk is low. So you're going to give them the option of surgery before um, proceeding with this device. I will say that there are studies now looking at intermediate risk patients or patients with moderate MR. So again, we are going to push the envelope, but up till now, uh, we are only uh, approved for pro prohibitive surgical risk and degenerative MR. If you look at the real time sort of uh, uh, safety and complications, once the, uh, the FDA approved the device, then there were sort of uh, there's uh, some data on real time actual commercial use of the device. So in real time, we're talking about a 93% procedural success rate, much higher than Everest. And this is again because of the devices, um, the technology is improving, and also because of the operator experience with the, the device. Um, with 8% complications, 1% uh, based on the transeptal, uh, about 1% stroke, device embolization is very low, but not zero, uh, and 30-day um, mortality is about 6%. But procedural mortality is extremely low. So prohibitive risk is defined by a 30-day STS score of either 8% for mitral valve replacement or 6% for mitral valve repair or patients who fall out of STS, for example, cirrhotic patients or patients with hostile chest or frailty. The 2020 guidelines for the ACCHA were um, updated to include uh, mitral clip as a 2A indication for those patients who are at prohibitive surgical risk. So COAPT is the other major landmark study that I said I was gonna sort of review, and I'm gonna do it a little quickly because I wanna get to some cases, but um, mitral clip, uh, COAP was probably, in my opinion, one of the most impactful studies in, that I can remember in the field of cardiology because it was just such a positive study. And I don't think anybody had seen anything like this uh, um, since uh, or in, in, in cardiology before. It was, a, it was a randomized control study looking at mitral clip compared to medical therapy alone in patients who um, uh, had functional regurgitation at least three to four plus. Uh, and it was a larger study, 300 in each group. Um, the exclusion criteria were patients who had advanced heart failure. So we're taking, we're talking about patients who were not on inotropes, uh, who did not have pulmonary hypertension severe, who did not have um, a valve area less than uh, four or poor life expectancy. Um, and um, these patients had to be seen by a heart failure specialist. This is really important. And really, I think one of the strengths of COAPT was that these patients had to fail medical therapy and there was a roll in phase where they had to be on medical therapy for a certain period of time. And they had to go undergo CRT if they were candidates before they were evaluated um, or they, before they were eligible for the study. So um, the primary and secondary endpoints were, um, you know, the primary was efficacy and, sa efficacy and safety and secondary, there were many, many secondary endpoints and I listed only the main ones here on this page. Baseline characteristics were very similar between the two groups, but I will just point out that the EROA, which is a measure of the regurgitant orifice area, was 0.4, which is 
actually on the more severe side as compared to Mitra FR, which was another study that came out just before COAPT where the ERA was uh, 0.3. So this study looked at patients with more significant MR and their LVN uh, systolic and diastolic volumes were also slightly lower than uh, the counterparts in the Mitra FR study. So the primary efficacy was uh, um, positive for MitraClip having less uh, heart failure hospitalizations uh, with a um, uh, significant reduction at two years compared to medical therapy alone. Uh, and if you look at all the secondary endpoints, um, I think they were all positive for CLIP. So every single secondary endpoint that, that, that they looked at was essentially favored uh, mitral CLIP over uh, goal-directed medical therapy alone. Um, the number to treat for all-cause mortality or heart failure ho hospitalization was only uh, about five, which is pretty amazing. And uh, the number to treat uh, as well for all cause mortality was about six. So a very positive study. And it um, really uh, led to um, standing audience uh, um, uh, applause at, TV, at TCT. So it was pretty amazing uh, when that, that study came out. So uh, the conclusions are that MitraClip is a safe and effective therapy to reduce heart failure in patients with severe degenerative and functional MR despite goal-directed medical therapy. And these uh, may improve mortality as a secondary endpoint from co-opt. But patient selection is key. You have to have enough MR and you have to have a, a dimension. Your neck can't be too dilated or have too much volume uh, and your heart failure can't be too advanced uh, and you must fail goal-directed medical therapy. So those are some considerations when you, um, when you choose your patients. Um, looking at real quick, the FDA approved uh, MitroClip for functional MR in 2019. Uh, so this was also big news. Um, since then, I would say that the number of patients who undergo MitroClip now is really increasing for functional MR. Uh, you know, about 50, 60 percent of the patients that I do have functional MR as opposed to, you know, when when we start, first started doing this um, these procedures before FDA approval. This has led to the 2020 updated guidelines for MitroClip in patients with functional MR to be updated again to 2A uh, for patients at an EF between 20 and 50 who have dimensions less than 70 and PA pressures less than 50, less than 70. So here I'm going to start with my first case, and I have a series of four. I hope the, the echoes play for you guys, but um, this is the first case that I ever did uh, about four years ago. Um, and I like to show it because it was kind of like your type A patient uh, and I and type A valve, not type A patient, type A valve. Uh, and you'll see that I'm going to be using these type A, type B, type C. These are not uh, validated or study descriptions, but this is how I sort of look at these valves in terms of the straightforward, the kind of intermediate or the more difficult valve. And so she was that type A valve where um, she presented uh, with AFib, shortness of breath. She was admitted to an outside hospital. Uh, she had heart and renal failure. She had severe MR with a preserved EF, posterior leaflet prolapse by echo. She was not uh, very dilated. Uh, she had a TE that showed severe MR with a P2 prolapse. She was evaluated for surgery. Uh, she was diuresed a bit, but her creatinine was rising. She became progressively hypotensive and she was referred to UCLA for further management. So we discussed her via heart team approach. We didn't even consider doing an angiogram for her because she had uh, kidney uh, re renal failure. And we had our teams together, our imaging teams, our, our uh, cardiac surgeons and anesthesiologists, and we brought her to the, the lab. Here's her uh, valve on the left. You can see that this is called the bicomisher view. Um, you have in the middle, the A2P2 leaflet there. Uh, and you can see that there's a ruptured cord in the middle of the the valve there, uh, right, nice and central. If you look at the um, X plane there, which is basically the orthogonal view, you'll see that there's a beautiful um, P2 prolapse with a hanging cord there that's flying, uh, flying backwards, causing a very eccentric anterior hugging jet. And we go ahead and proceed with MitroClip. And so the first step in MitroClip is the transeptal. And you can see here that the transeptal puncture has to be 
uh, in a certain place uh, for you to be able to deliver the device uh, um, uh, comfortably. So we like to go uh, mid fossa and posterior about four centimeters above the mitral valve annulus. So we measure that and then we stick. Uh, we then advance the clip, um, the, uh, the, sorry, the guide uh, across into the left atrium. And once we have the guide across, then we advance the clip here. You can see the clip being advanced in the left atrium. And then we steer down to the mitral valve using these um, steerable knobs. We then open the clip and we look at its orientation on a 3D on FOSS view. And in this view, the aorta is on top. So you can see the anterior leaflet on the top and the posterior leaflet on the bottom. And this, um, this uh, orientation is about uh, correct where we want it to be orthogonal or perpendicular to the plane of coaptation. And we can see that we're also uh, landing on top of the pisa. So we wanna make sure that our clip is exactly where that jet of regurgitation is. And so um, we often will say, advance the clip so you split the pisa. You basically go right down where the defect is. Um, once you're opened underneath the ventricle, uh, you know, we pull back and here's some pictures of the grass. But you pull back up right at that prolapse or flail segment. You can see the cord kind of being secured into the leaflets. We check the mean gradient after we close the leaflet. You see up here on the right, leaflets being, um, valves being closed, sorry, the device is being closed. And then we check a gradient. The mean gradient is low here. It's about five, it's acceptable. We release the device and we see that we have a significant reduction in regurgitation. We have a beautiful double orifice valve. And um, we're checking our, what we call the tissue bridge, which is making sure we have insertion. And then we release the device um, what's amazing about these procedures is that you can have live hemodynamics, you know, unlike surgery where the patient is on pump and you really don't understand the hemodynamics of a mitral valve with these procedures, the hemodynamics are so incredible because as you're closing the device, you can see left atrial pressure immediately go down and you see aortic pressure immediately increase. Uh, and you'll see then the cardiac output go up, um, significantly. We like to see the ejection fraction drop, which means that we have a good, uh, you know, increase in afterload from the uh, reduction in regurgitation, which is, it means the procedure was successful. This patient clinically did extremely well. Um, <clears throat> she was uh, immediate, very quickly weaned off her pressors. Her creatinine came down, and she was really um, discharged only three days after. And uh, she's still my patient. This was about four or five years ago, and she's doing well. She hasn't had any recurrent MR. This is a second case. This one's more challenging. I'm just showing you again how we move. We can move from a very straightforward valve to a valve that's much more complicated. This is a patient who you can see here uh, has a P2 uh, prolapse, but one thing you'll notice is that there's a significant area of calcium encroaching at the base of the leaflet and actually going right underneath that shelf of calcium that's under the posterior leaflet. Uh, and you can see that there's even some calcium um, as well at the tips of the leaflets. So if you look at the, um, this valve, you know, I call this like my type C valve. It's the valve that has, first of all, a very torrential and severe MR. You have calcium at the base of the um, annulus, most, mostly posterior, creating this shelf. You also have an adjacent cleft. So if you look at the bottom left, you'll see a piece of calcium um, at the posterior leaflet. And then right next to it, there's a defect in the posterior leaflet. And this is called a cleft. Um, thankfully, there was there was not as much MR through the cleft, but there certainly was some MR through that cleft. And the valve area, though, thankfully, uh, was very generous. We had a valve area of eight, and our imaging was favorable. So these are all kind of the pros and cons of the valve in terms of assessing your morphology. So we start with our first device, which is an XT device. And we similarly do, as I mentioned earlier, we do our transeptal, we steer down, we assess coaptation. Uh, on the 3D on FOSS views until where plane of coaptation is perpendicular to the device. And we advance the clip below the leaflets um, and then come back and do our initial grasp. So this is the picture of our initial grasp here. We tried to um, sort of go where there was a significant prolapse slightly medial to that P2 section. And then um, we see that um, there's still regurgitation after the first clip uh, laterally. So we decide that we're going to zip and clip, meaning we're going to put our second clip next to the first clip and continue, uh, put a, you know, um, continue because our gradient was only two. So we decide to put a second clip, we put our second clip and we see here, there's a good tissue bridge. 
And now if we look our, at our MR, we still have more MR uh, a little bit laterally. So we see that our MR is actually coming from right around where that cleft was and that piece of calcium is. So we put a third clip and we um, go in with our third clip just lateral to the second two, but we need to take into, take into consideration that cleft. So the angle of our third clip is a little different as opposed to being you know, 11 and five were more like uh, one and seven to try to sort of bring that cleft on the other side of the cleft to sort of uh, bring that together and see if we can impact regurgitation. And you can see here that chunk of calcium that's sort of interacting with that posterior arm. As we bring the clip back and close, we get a, a nice result. We have much less regurgitation. We have three clips, we have a double orifice and we are left with an acceptable gradient of three. Um, this patient has also done well with sustained improvement at three um, at 12 months. So this was a more complicated valve. There was a cleft, there was calcium, uh, and um, there were uh, the PISA was wide, meaning that there were multiple uh, clips that were necessary to achieve reduction. Favorable elements were favorable imaging and valve area. So now our third case, this is a 66-year-old male with end-stage liver disease, cirrhotic, shortness of breath. He was actually being, he's actually being evaluated for a liver transplant. So this patient here has a um, prolapse and flail of the posterior leaflet. You can see that tissue uh, coming back up, a uh, pretty significant uh, regurgitant jet there that's eccentric. When we look at the uh, 3D on FOSS, it's kind of neat. You see these fingers kind of projecting upwards, these cords that are torn that are prolapsing, uh, you know, um, more, more central and lateral, resulting in this wall-hugging eccentric uh, anterior, anterior directed jet. Um, again, this looks like a type A valve, right? Like similar to the last patient I showed you, should be straightforward, right? Um, uh, so we go ahead and we plan our first clip. We want to nail the flail, as I like to say. I like to sort of find that defect and really go right for it, see if I can reduce regurgitation with this the least number of clips as possible. So we sort of stay a little laterally and we hit that flail. Um, after the first clip, we're pretty happy. We have some reduction in MR, but we can see that medially um, there's still a, a flail and you can see these cords sort of coming back towards us. So we go ahead and proceed with the second clip more medially. And again, we're trying to nail that residual flail. And we think we have that piece here is swinging where we grasp, close the clip, and lo and behold, we're happy. We have a decent result here between our two clips. So we decide to deploy, we finish up the case, um, but I'm not showing this case because it was easy. I'm showing you a complicated case. And so what happens to the patient? About one month later, he's feeling good, but two months later he has recurrent shortness of breath and we bring him back and we see, uh-oh, we have more regurgitation again. And we can see that there's a small flail in between the two clips. This is not a very good situation. It's challenging. What do we do next? He has cirrhosis. We can't send him for surgery. He's not gonna be listed for transplant of a liver unless we deal with this valve. So let's see if there's anything we can do. What we do is we take a um, bicomical review and we can see that right between the clips, there's this flail section and that the distance between the clips is a bit over seven millimeters. And it's actually enough to try to see if we can squeeze a third clip between the first two clips. And again, this is a one-way ticket. Once we go through these clips, it would be really difficult or nearly impossible to come back out. So we do this very, very carefully with um, fluoroscopy actually helps you a lot as you sort of see the third clip very um, carefully moving it. We use a small clip, we're using an NT here. And you can see how you carefully can go in between two clips, uh, being careful not to disrupt the other clips. Uh, and so you can see that passing uh, carefully and you know your blood pressure goes up and you sort of stop breathing for a few seconds there when you do these. Uh, and then you come back and we closed and we were pretty happy. Um, our final result was pretty good. You can see here that um, we had very little regurgitation and we were able to secure that third clip in between the prior two and, uh, and we were happy and the patient um, did feel better uh, after this procedure. So um, I'll be wrapping up soon. I just wanna give you one more case to take you home with, but 
to understand that the future of this technology, you know, there are many populations that we really haven't, we don't know too much about, for example, the congenital heart disease population. And fortunately at UCLA, we have extremely uh, large and very, very um, wonderful ACHD program led by Dr. Abu Hosan. And so we've done several patients with ACHD uh, off-label use of the device. And I'll show you one patient in a minute, uh, but that's a wonderful sort of area of exploration. And obviously in the tricuspid valve, we have several trials, Illuminate and CLASP, which um, are looking at these CLIP uh, devices on the tricuspid side. And, and obviously, as I mentioned earlier, TMV replacement is a huge um, uh, frontier that would deserve another lecture. So we've done about 20 off-label cases of MitroClip, and we've done them in patients with, you know, Epstein's, Tetralogy, single ventricle, TGAs, uh, and off-label tricuspids. This is a case that we just did um, actually two weeks ago, but I thought it was a wonderful case, a 32-year-old. He has a congenital DTGA uh, with a hypoplastic left ventricle, um, and he had had already undergone four open-heart surgeries since childhood, uh, and he had a systemic right ventricle that was moderately reduced in function. And as you know, that's the natural history of this process where the systemic RV fails, uh, usually it's second or third decade, decade, and you get resultant um, malcoaptation of that systemic tricuspid valve leading to um, uh, regurgitation. And this patient was turned down for a um, fifth sternotomy and referred for mitroclip. So we did the procedure we entered the valve, um, the uh, and I'll call it the right atrium, but it's the systemic venous atria through the baffle. So we actually punctured the baffle uh, and um, entered. And you can see here, this looks like your typical tricuspid, but again, it's systemic. You have a posterior uh, sept leaflet, a septal leaflet in the middle and the anterior leaflet here. And you can see the regurgitation is really central, more a little bit more to the septal anterior, although you don't appreciate that too much yet. You'll see that the, there's malcoaptation of the leaflets. And then if you look at a transgastric, you'll also notice that, again, that you have more regurgitation at the septal anterior plane. You also have a cleft at the anterior leaflet. So you can really appreciate how complicated that the anterior leaflet is actually two different um, leaflets. So you have almost like a quadrileaflet um, tricuspid valve here. Like I mentioned earlier, every valve is different. Um, so we decided to go for our first clip. Uh, we, we, again, we pre-dilated the baffle, we advanced the clip below the uh, tricuspid valve or the systemic tricuspid valve into the RV, opened the, the clip, pulled back and sort of grabbed that first uh, um, section of regurgitation at the septal anterior interface. And um, we were able to get a good grasp there. So you can see here in the transgastric, we have our first clip here at the septal anterior interface but we still have re residual regurgitation at the more the septal posterior interface here. So you can see this, the, sorry, the anterior posterior leaflet here. So you can see the anterior leaflet we've been able to grab here. Here's that cleft. You have that um, posterior leaflet here and that septal leaflet up there. So we were able to proceed with the second clip at the central anterior posterior interface. And um, we were able to uh, reduce that regurgitation down from I would say torrential severe to mild moderate. Uh, and you can see that there's a nice uh, 3D on FOSS here where that septal anterior commissure is essentially fused. Uh, and you had a mean gradient of two. We closed the ASD baffle with a, um, with a six millimeter device and the patient did well. So um, a little bit of off-label kind of future directions for this technology. And I'm gonna end here with a few minutes for questions, but I just wanna say that these procedures and these, uh, you know, management of these patients really requires a team effort. And, and at UCLA, we have a wonderful team of surgeons, anesthesiologists, imaging uh, cardiologists, and uh, again, the adult congenital program. Uh, we work really um, very closely all together and uh, discuss each of these cases individually. Um, here's our team of, of doctors listed here, and I'm really grateful to um, all of them for uh, all the uh, help and assistance with all the cases uh, that we do, because we do them as a team. So thank you very much. Um, and Dr. Bortnick, if you have any questions for me, I'm all set, done with my presentation. Wow, that, that was a fantastic overview of um, an evolving field. It's really changed over the past decade in terms of the indications and um, 
you know, what kind of patients uh, we're taking now. Um, thank you for that. Hey, I have a few questions. You know, I want to ask you, I looked at, you know, thinking about your cases that you're showing, you're showing a lot of acutely ill individuals. And I'm wondering if we're intervening too late. Do you get the feeling that when people are referred to you, it's just, you know, a little, a little late? Oh, a hundred percent. I think that, you know, there are studies looking at moderate MR intervening sooner or intermediate risk patients, but unfortunately, um, we're not even catching those. We're catching people that are already coming in in heart failure and renal failure. So, you know, we have a big window. I mean, we could be earlier or but we could even be appropriate, but we're still missing it, which is why I say that the awareness is so important to raise awareness for this because I think, you know, AS has gotten great headlines, but I really think that MR, we need to really advertise to our cardiologists and our primary care doctors and that, you know, you, you have mitral regurgitation, please refer that patient to a cardiologist and don't ignore that valve, you know, and understand the etiology really carefully. Cause on a trans echo, I see a lot of echoes where they just say moderate MR, but not all moderate is the same and not all MR is the same. So you really need to look at the echo yourself, you know, and really kind of, you know, get a TEE if you're not sure, because I think we're missing a lot of patients, like exactly like you said, they're coming in sicker and later. And the story in the tricuspid valve is even worse. I mean, tricuspid valve is, is, I mean, we see patients essentially cirrhotic and in renal failure. I mean, those are the patients that we see, which is really sad because I think MR and TR have been underappreciated, undertreated uh, for a very long time. So I think it behooves us as a community to really treat these patients. So I see, you know, multiple um, comments from Dr. Yorty, our section head of heart failure, uh, who's very involved in, um, you know, managing mitral valve disease. And he, he had a couple questions. And uh, one of those things relates to, you know, what is effective medical therapy now? We've had some updates in the heart failure space. We now have, you know, ARNI and we have SGTL2 inhibitors that are, you know, being used more often. When you are evaluating patients and you want them to, let's say you have the time, you know, these are, let's say patients where you have a moment to medically manage them. Um, are you requiring that they be on these more up-to-date medications or are you accepting, you know, um, lisinopril, spironolactone, you know, some of the older, you know, GDM? No, in fact, we just wrote, we, I just uh, wrote an editorial with a fellow about this exact topic. Um, that we, you know, with SGT, SGTL2 inhibitors and ARNIs, you know, we, we should be including them as goal directed because, you know, at the time of COEPT, these drugs didn't exist. And so now we, we don't need another study to look at whether or not you need to add these. I think we should all be adding them because it's, we know that these drugs do make a significant difference. And we have patients that look like they should be clipped. And then you, you know, we send them to our heart failure specialists and that they're put on, you know, ARNIs and SGTL2 inhibitors and their MR gets significantly better. And I'd much rather avoid clipping a valve if I don't have to. So hundred percent, they should all get CRT if, if, if um, able, and they should all be on up to date, including ARNIs and SGTL2 inhibitors. And that's my opinion. And we do practice that at UCLA. And I think that's one of the reasons why when you look at, um, you know, volumes, you have to take into consideration that we probably shouldn't be clipping as much as if we are clipping a lot, we need to really look and make sure that we're not clipping, you know, patients that would maybe be okay if they had the most up-to-date um, sort of medical therapies. And so um, I, I, I'm very careful about that, extremely careful about that, because I, I don't want to clip a valve. And, you know, we're talking about a 90% success, but then there's 10% risk that you didn't treat the MR, you have, you know, you, you created more MR or your leaflets, you know, your clip didn't sit perfectly. And now you've taken a, you know, a functional MR and made it degenerative. Cause once your clip is there, you're no longer functional right now that now you have a problem if you have a complication or you didn't get a good result. Um, so I don't like to convert that stable, you know, it's like that stable limb into that critical limb, you know, with <laughs> vascular disease, it's the same thing. You want to create change that stable valve and make it an unstable valve. And so I feel very strongly about that. Um, some other questions too. I noticed that um, there's a large amount of uh, bleeding associated with the, with the procedure. And this might've been some older data, but I'm wondering now um, in your, you know, what you've seen, 
with managing you know, this larger French size in a venous system, are you using a lot of per clothes or other devices to close the vein? And you know, have you been able to move the needle on the bleeding part? You know, it's interesting. We haven't seen a lot of bleeding. I don't have, I mean, I don't know. I mean, again, maybe it was an initial, initial sort of experience, but with pre-close, I use one to two pre-closes on every case. And even if the pre-close fails, you know, you can reverse anticoagulation and then we put a mattress suture, you know, it's a venous sheath and uh, we haven't really had any major bleeding complications from the device because it's venous. And so you're not dealing like TAVR with large bore arterial access. And so I'm, I'm less sort of concerned about that bleeding risk, particularly because we, we per close and it's venous. Right. It just seemed like a, a high percentage. Um, I think the, the other uh, question that we have is, you know, when, as you're looking at the, the valve anatomy, when do you consider that maybe what they need is some other more um, uh, different approach, you know, like an annuloplasty or this ventriculoplasty type idea um, from the AccuSinge, um, you know, or, or that they, they really just need, let's say, valve replacement. You know, how are you going to differentiate, you know, based on the valve anatomy, who needs a non, you know, tier intervention? I think that's a really important question. And I think surgeons face a similar question when they're in the OR, should they replace or repair? I think, you know, it's, it's an anatomical decision. And so if you have a patient who has high gradient, who, um, who's calcified annulus, who has poor windows, who has, um, a wide PISA or commissural MR, these are all things that make clip a little less desirable. And so in those patients, either I won't clip them because they don't have favorable, favorable anatomy. Uh, and I you will either rediscuss high, high, high risk surgery with the surgeon or try to find them, you know, put them in a trial for, uh, you know, TMVR. Um, unfortunately right now we don't really have any other devices that are FDA approved. They're all clinical trial based. And so in terms of picking a device, Fortunately, in some ways, we don't, we're not faced with too many decisions. It's either, can you clip this or do you have a trial where you can enroll that patient um, or is, is a surgeon willing to take an exceptionally high risk um, and do surgery? So I would say that um, in the future, when we do really have many more devices that are FDA proven, proven to be just as efficacious, efficacious and have the same results or better, then um, it's going to be an individual valve decision based on anatomy, just like a surgeon you know, is this going to surgeon repair or replace? I think the next question is once you put a clip in, how do you convert? Can you ever go from a clip to a TMVR? And I think that there are, you know, um, uh, you know, companies looking at, you know, how to remove clips percutaneously and, and, you know, put valves in. Those are all future, future, because you don't really want to take one path and not be able to go the other way. And so once you put a clip in, it's almost like you're destined for that technology and you can't really get um, a valve replacement in the future. You can get an annuloplasty ring. Obviously those don't affect um, your, your clip, but um, it will affect your other candidacy for other procedures. Right. Um, so the, the other uh, kind of, just to wrap things up because we're getting late an hour here um, is uh, related to, um, you know, the, the Mitra FR trial. And there's a lot of debate, debate, discussion about the fine points between co-opt and mitra FR. And you know, how does that? How do you think about this discrepancy? And, and does it influence your practice? You know, it does. I actually do look at LV volumes, um, and I look at ERAs. And there's a nice little table um, out there, kind of comparing, you know, whether your patient falls in that mitra FR or that co-opt based on the ratio of your EROA to your LV and diastolic volume. And I do take that into consideration. So if I see a very dilated, sick ventricle with only moderate to severe MR, I usually will say, you know what, this patient's more of a mitra FR and I won't clip it, or I'll say it's not a good idea, as opposed to a patient who has a smaller dimension, less dilated uh, with severe MR, when I'll say, well, this patient is more likely to benefit than the other. So I do absolutely use my far in practice. And it's one of the reasons, one of the things I look at when I, when I look at functional, and I just really want to comment because I'm just seeing some points, um, chats about functional, the cases that I showed were, um, mostly all degenerative. And so, um, but the, uh, the, um, 
all functional cases, anyone that has a functional MR here, at least at UCLA, has to be seen by a heart failure specialist. And we, again, that's why I mentioned earlier, we work as a team with heart failure. Many of them may need transplant. Again, so we have a very, uh, you know, um, active transplant program. And so we, uh, it's very important that people know that we would never put a clip in a patient who hadn't been seen by a heart failure specialist who had functional MR. Yeah, no, I think that this is a, you know, really great point and uh, speaks to the contribution of so many different points of view on this very complex um, you know, task of managing a, a difficult valve situation. But I, I think it's an amazing amount of progress that we've made in a short period of time. And I think there's a lot more to come. Thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing at UCLA and the contributions that you're making in this field. And thank I wanna you. thank you for taking time at a very early hour <laughs> to share your deep knowledge and you know really impressive cases with us um, what wonderful success you've been having there and you know we want to see more from you and uh, thank you more from you so uh, thanks everyone this is concluding our our at Monty Hart cath conference for this Tuesday I want to wish you all a good morning a good afternoon or a good night depending on where you are in the world and if you missed uh, the content you can catch it on our YouTube channel Thank you so much to uh, Millie Audino for putting it together and running it. And um, uh, thanks everyone for your attendance. Thank you.